I want to wish you all good morning. I am Nicola Barrett, the Chief Corporate Learning Officer at Emory Executive Education at Goysweather Business School. Thank you for joining us this morning uh, in the second of our uh, Business Over Breakfast uh, series. The school is named after Roberto C. Goizueta, um, and he challenged us uh, many years ago to not just teach the way business is today, but how business will be. Our faculty guide, uh, Tom Smith, uh, who will be uh, talking to us today and over the next several webinars, has been practicing just that. I think over the last uh, several weeks, he has facilitated and taught more online sessions um, than he has uh, regularly in the classroom. Um, and so with the success that he and other faculty have been having, um, teaching online, we're actually planning on incorporating much more of that into our regular regular programming past uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic. In fact, Tom just finished a two-day online version of the Finance for Non-Financial Managers and uh, is also gearing up uh, to teach a five-week uh, workshop on personal finance. So I reckon you must be pretty tired, Tom. No, I'm doing okay. I got my beautiful backyard. This is there's all these screenshots that everybody has of like the Golden Gate Bridge, but this is my actual backyard. So. <laughs> Lucky you. I'm, I'm happy. Good. So our goal to, with today's webinar is to really help us understand what's happening in the economy and how this influences and impacts us individually, as well as our families, um, our businesses and our communities. Tom Smith is an expert in so many things. So I have to read this, Tom. Um, labor economics, pricing, sports economics and financing, the economics of the entertainment industry, and also healthcare. So needless to say, he's more than qualified to address us on the topic of uh, the economy and me. The way this uh, webinar will uh, work, uh, similar to the first one we ran a week ago and the next three that we'll be running every Thursday morning at nine uh, during April. Tom's going to kick us off with his observations about what's been happening in the economy mm -hmm. and what this might mean for, uh, for individuals, followed by uh, about 30 minutes or so of questions and answers. So please write your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. Um, and our team will do their best to get um, as many of those answered uh, during the session as possible. And then we're also figuring out how to get the ones that we can't get to uh, during today uh, answered on our uh, link, uh, Emory Executive Education LinkedIn platform. Uh, at the end of today's session, there will be a short five question survey. There was a little hiccup last week, but we've fixed that. Thank you, team. Um, and we'd really appreciate you filling that in because that's really helpful for us. So enjoy the morning, um, enjoy your coffee, stay healthy and safe and sane. Uh, and I look forward to continuing the conversation every Thursday morning. Thank you, Tom. Oh, thank you, Nicola. All right, so um, I'm going to share a Word document. I think actually this time I might actually move it to some different charts instead of just sticking on one chart. Uh, clearly, the conversation gets uh, gets very um, intense, and so I'm sometimes I think I'm not thinking about the visual aids so much. So here I'm going to share this right away, and okay, um, hopefully you can you can see this. Okay, yep. So this is, I, I wanted to start here with the macroeconomic overview. Um, the Department of Labor released about 30 minutes ago that the initial unemployment claims for April 4th were 6.6 .6 million. And the unemployment claims um, for the previous week were adjusted upwards just a little bit. So you got about 6.8, 6, 6, .8, uh, 6 7 million, and then the previous week was about 3.3 million. Um, so what we have is somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, 16, 17 million people applying for unemployment insurance for the first time. So new unemployment claims in the last three weeks. Right. To give you an idea about how insane this is, because it is insane, here, this is, this, is a, this is a chart from Louisiana, and so New Orleans. This was, we were talking about this last week. This is Hurricane Katrina spiked up here, and the initial unemployment claims 
um, that were following Hurricane Katrina. And this was two weeks ago. Um, it went up to about 97,000 uh, uh, new claims um, last week and um, another, another 90 claims April 4th, the 90 million claim, or excuse me, 90,000 claims April 4th. Look at what we have for New York, just to sort of base set, right? This was during the whole last economic recession. So during the economic recession, the, the most unemployment claims that we saw at any one time, and this was a bad recession, was upwards of 50, 55,000 new unemployment claims. It's not quite double that in New York, but it's close. During the last economic recession in New York, we had some prevailing unemployments at about 13 and a half percent. Okay, in New Orleans here, we had prevailing unemployment of 16% uh, that lasted, you know, for a couple quarters after Hurricane Katrina. So you have to imagine that if we've got twice this, right, so we have consecutive weeks of this many people filing new unemployment claims in, in Louisiana, we have multiple weeks where people are, are, have these high rates of unemployment claims, then the unemployment rates in these cities is two, two and a half to three times what we saw in, in New Orleans, so 15%. So, so add double that perhaps, so maybe 30%, could be 35% unemployment. Um, so that's unprecedented. That's Great Depression kind of uh, numbers. And so we're certainly setting a new standard for the depth uh, and the reach of this economic recession. Okay. So this is, this is what concerns me a lot is that, you know, one out of uh, every five people that you're walking around with, maybe two out of every five people that you're walking around with um, is unemployed or two out of five people that you know is now unemployed or furloughed. And so and the difference between being furloughed and unemployed is that if you're furloughed, you, you retain a relationship with the company, but there's no work for you to do. When the company comes back online, they can, um, they can get you working much quicker so they don't have to go through the process of the hiring and the firing, which can be very time intensive. But if you're furloughed, you can still apply for unemployment insurance because you have no work to do. You're not physically working and the company that, that furloughs you they're not paying you. And so I would imagine that these unemployment claims include people who've been outright fired, but also people who've been furloughed. So people who still have, let's say, a tether to their company, but aren't currently receiving an income because the company has no revenue. The company has no work. They're not able to actually sell their wares, if you will. Okay, so I know a lot of questions are going to come on, and they're already coming in. I'm I'm happy to take a you know some questions right away. Actually, uh, Keisha or Christine. Hi Tom. Um, yes, there is a question uh, here. Someone has a question about the implementation of the recent payroll pay payment plan. Yeah, let Perhaps. me. I'm gonna, it's very good. That's right. I'm gonna, let me scroll up to this. This okay. is. Um, um, I have to, I'm going to have to zoom out just a little bit for this. This is some of the provisions of the CARES Act, okay? So the, the CARES Act signed into law March 27th. It's a fiscal stimulus, uh, social safety net combination of, um, of pieces of uh, – part of the legislation includes all these different things, okay? So the payroll protection program, this – provides up to 100 million in loans for businesses with less than 500 workers. So the payroll protection plan can't be used for, for companies that have more than 500 workers. Um, the loan amount is based on two and a half times the average monthly payroll. And so you have to report your 940s, um, how much you actually paid your employ, employees. And then you can, from your 940s, you can calculate um, you know, th just the calculation is just two and a half times that. And so then you can apply for that much for a loan. They will forgive up to 25% of that loan if you can then prove that you are using those funds to rehire or retain your workers. And so I guess at the end of this program, they will ask for some kind of, um, some kind of information to confirm that. Here's, 
let's say, a problem with this, and we've been reading about this. Uh, some banks, Chase, they've been in the news, they were not prepared for the level of applications. Um, they were not ready to start submitting these applications last Friday when this thing came online. And as a result, uh, you know, tens of thousands of businesses who bank with Chase um, haven't been able to apply for these loans. And I'm not just picking on Chase. <clears throat> there are other banks, larger banks, that have also um, been had some difficulties submitting these loans. So these loans, the payroll protection plan loans, are through the um, SBA, the Small Business Administration, and you and so Small Business Administration loans. In order to apply for them, you actually have to go to a vendor like a bank. Um, that's a little bit different than these other grants, this Economic Injury and Disaster Loan Grant. So since it was declared we were under a national emergency, you can go in directly to that loan program and uh, you put in your, you know, your FEIN number, um, some information about your revenue and your COGS and your net income operating expenses, and you can apply for a $10,000 grant. Both of these uh, programs are terrific ideas. Companies need um, revenue. They're not gonna get it because they can't sell anything. So they need funds, they need liquidity to stay in business. The problem is the implementation clearly, right? I'm not the only person saying this, is that the banking system along with the SBA system itself was not prepared for the massive number of loan applications that came flooding in last week. And so there were some bottlenecks and clearly banks trying to communicate with the SBA, individual bankers trying to communicate with their clients. I mean, Chase says, just don't even call. It isn't gonna happen. Uh, working with a small community banker, you might get some questions answered. Somebody might be able to help you walk through the loan application process. I know Chase's loan, loan this sounds like terrible. I bank with Chase and uh, you know, I really don't wanna be um, trashing them. Uh, but it was, I mean, it, it was a terrible rollout. And that unfortunately makes what could be a good, a good solution, uh, not much of a solution right away because people aren't sure if, when they're going to get their money. So that, that's that. I don't, I don't know if there were some additional questions about that particular element. And I could certainly talk about some of the other extensions or some of the other elements of the CARES Act. But I'm, I'm, I'm curious what other people have, have to say or other questions. Tom, how does that work for employees over 100K? Do you get compensation for each employee? No. So, yeah, so, so that's right. So the payroll protection plan, and I'm sorry, Christine, I didn't mean to cut you off. The payroll protection plan, it will cover the, the, the compensation of your employees, but not 100% of what you call um, highly compensated employees. So highly compensated employees, any employee he or who earns over 100,000, you can retain them, but you would have to bring them at a level down to 100,000 or below. But we've seen some very creative, let's say hiring um, practices and working with employees from companies. So I was working with a company and my wife was working with a company and this company said, look, we want to stay in business. And the C-suite said, we're going to stay in business. So the C-suite all took uh, payroll cuts uh, down to minimum wage. So they said, just pay us uh, minimum wage. Even though they're, they are overtime exempt employees, they, they said, look, just you have to you have to pay us something. And so you can't work for free. That's that's uh, against the law. But you can work for minimum wage. So they brought them down to minimum wage and then they're using those resources to pay employees. But this payroll protection plan also uh, gives em employers flexibility. So they could use those funds for rents, mortgages, utilities, um, other types of costs that they would incur. And so you know, if you have highly compensated employees, you're, you're going to have to, if you want you can't pay, a, you know, a $2 million salary from this, just, that's just not allowed, but you can pay up to $100,000. And so you might have to modify the employment 
uh, relationship with your employees for the short time if you have highly compensated employees? Um, under that plan, if the small business owner is a sole proprietor with contract workers, is the owner's salary covered if the business has been impacted? Yeah, so if you, in the application, there's an opportunity to load up uh, what would be called a Schedule C. So if you work as a uh, sole proprietor, so you, you, you're not an S Corp or a C Corp, then your taxes would ordinarily be listed under your personal taxes, but under a Schedule C. I, I'm not an accountant, but I've done this enough time and I've been working with enough people to understand these, these nuances. And so you, when you go into the Schedule C, what will happen is um, retained earnings essentially becomes uh, self-employment wages. And then your tax, if you, if you do this on the Schedule C, you're taxed, uh, there's additional hit on you for self-employment tax. And so you can apply and instead of loading up your 940s, you'll load up your Schedule C to show how much you pay yourself. Um, it's not... And, and if you're an independent contractor, you can do the same thing. But it's not clear that you can use what you pay your independent contractors because uh, you're, well, you're going you're gonna to hire, keep these people on even though they're ICs and they're, they have nothing to do. So it's not clear that you can use any of those funds to compensate your independent contractors if you are, let's say, a sole proprietor. But you can definitely use it to compensate your own wages. That's that I know for, is true because I've, I've seen that go. I saw that how that worked. Thank you. If America's economy is affected, and so is every other economy, will COVID nineteen have a leveling effect across the different nations' GDP? Um, it won't. It won't bring them all down to the same level. What it does is it will depress everybody, and depending on let's say, how much of your economy is service-oriented, um, what part of your economy can get back to work, what you consider to be um, necessary uh, work or, or um, critical work, uh, your economy might get, back to, um, might get back to work faster or you're not going to suffer as significant um, decreases. So it's certainly not going to bring everybody down to the exact same GDP. That's not going to happen because countries were so uh, dispersed in terms of how much GDP they had. What will happen is that everybody's GDP will fall, maybe 15, 20 percent over a couple quarters, which is insane. A, a GDP fall of, let's say, five or six percent would be considered a significant recession. But if your you know if your GDP is falling two three four five six times that amount, you're talking about a real crippling effect on your economy. What's going to happen is that uh, countries that are countries that took an early hit and are now getting back to work, uh, their GDP is clearly going to ramp up. But you know some some countries who haven't seen anything. So in Wuhan and uh, Hebei province, they have been quarantined for whatever it is, 10, 15, 16 weeks now at this point. They're just getting back to work. So they didn't produce anything. So now their GDP, I mean, their GDP was zero. And so now it's going to start cranking up. And when it cranks up, it cranks up really fast. So the percentage increase is going to be triple digits because you go from zero to anything, you have you know thousands of percent change but it's gonna crank up to where it was, but it might take a long, long, long time to crank up to where it was. Let me, let me talk about this, even though that might not be a, a question. Um, I firmly believe that when the economy starts back up again, we are not gonna see the same combination of uh, companies, firms, or industries. I mean, I mentioned this last week, but I'm even more convinced after a couple of my MBA students sent out some, some uh, some flyers and some pieces of information from specific industries. So the American Restaurant Association is uh, very certain that maybe 75% of uh, restaurants are not gonna come back online after the recession. They just, they don't have the capital, they've blown through their savings and they say, forget about it. It's a tough enough industry to, to work in anyway. We certainly can't survive being out of work for eight, 10, 12 weeks. So let's just throw in the towel. 
And Amer American Restaurant Association is pretty convinced that a large share of the companies that are closed right now will never come back. Okay. And, and we have seen some reports of companies that say, forget about it. We're going to throw in the towel. I'm really concerned about the entertainment industry. Don't know how that's going to come back. Um, you know, movies, movies have seen a leveling off of people attending movies at theaters. But I think that maybe this will change the way that people behave. There's probably a lot of um, gyms, you know, personal fitness establishments that have just been destroyed as a result of this. Uh, they're working on pretty slim margins anyway, and a lot of these just might not come back. So there was a fitness studio that was going up right around the corner from my house, like a Eat the Frog, and they were in the process of building. Nobody's even inside building it out anymore. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this, you know, this poor franchisee who's bought the franchise and is building up a place and is trying to get clientele. It's the worst. I mean, they're, you know, it's, they've already got a bunch of money in. They probably have a ton of loans. They probably can't make those loan payments. Who knows? They might just like say, forget about it. Just leave everything there. I'm going to walk away. Here are the keys to the building, you know? So it's, I, I think that, you know, what we were going to see is going to be completely different um, when we come out of it than what we currently see. Other, other questions or thoughts? Yes. Tom, can you speak to the real estate industry as far as those who have investment property? Yeah, well, so these so uh, commercial backed um, properties. So we we already saw some companies come right out and say we're not paying rent. So the Cheesecake Factory, I mean, they tweeted and said, "Sorry, landlords, you're not going to see any money from us this month or next month or maybe ever again. Who knows?" So if you are owning commercial properties and you're relying on your tenants to pay for your strip mall or for other kinds of you know, commercial developments, then you are in significant trouble. And who knows, who knows if you'll be able to get some, um, some, little, some work with your bank. So you're gonna, you have a mortgage on that property, no doubt, and you're gonna have mortgage payments. Um, I mentioned this last week, but I, I want to double down because today's the ninth. So between April 1st and April 10th, $90 billion worth of mortgage and rent payments would, would have been made. And probably less than half of those have actually been made this month. And so we're talking about maybe between 40 and $45 billion of rent payments mortgage payments that haven't been processed because people just don't have the money. And so if you're, if you're owning commercial real estate, you're going to be left holding the bag. And then you've got to talk to your bank to see if there's going to be some kind of a deferment on, on your mortgage. So some banks, and I mentioned last week, some banks were saying, okay, fine, don't pay for the next three months. And then in 90 days, you owe us everything that you didn't pay that's an unworkable system. I mean, the likelihood that if somebody is unemployed now, that they'll have three months worth of their uh, mortgage payments in, in, in three months is unbelievable. Like it clearly can't happen. If they tack it on to the end of the mortgage, it might actually be workable. The problem is there is zero, let's say federal program or federal regulation changes that are mandating how it is that banks handle those missed mortgage payments. What there should be is some uh, large swooping regulation change that says, okay, every bank do this. If somebody pays, that's great. If they don't pay, then let's tack it on at the end of your 30 year mortgage or your 15 year mortgage or something like that. Um, and then, then you, it might be workable, but of course you'd have to have some regulations that change also the way that banks are holding capital because there are capital requirements that each bank has with respect to the type of assets that they carry on their balance sheet. So different assets have different tier classifications, tier one, tier two, okay? And these are established by banking regulators and these, these basal regulations. And so if the mortgages are becoming more risky because people aren't paying them, then banks are forced to liquidate the other assets to take 
to take capital against now these new risky mortgages. Well, as a result, we're seeing lots of uh, banks and other financial intermediaries liquidating assets to try to get capital just because they've got these capital requirements due to regulation. That's, it's very problematic because now you've got what used to be, let's say, a very solid bond, like a GE bond that had a yield of maybe 4.75% or 5%. All of a sudden, you've got a GE bond that has a yield of 10% or 11% or 12% because in order to liquidate it, you keep selling, pushing this GE bond out there huge supply of these bonds are now available and there's no demand. Nobody's buying them. There's no market. And so the, the price of the bond falls when the price of the bond falls, the yield of the bond goes way up. And so depending on how you define junk bonds, now some pensions are forced to liquidate what used to be, you know, tr you know, maybe say, let's say triple B or triple B plus bonds, some of those bonds might actually be downgraded in their ratings because, because the yields have gone too high or the bonds are based on, let's say commercial properties. So CMBSs, right? Commercial mortgage backed securities. All of a sudden these become junk bonds. These become junk securities. And so uh, pension funds might be forced to sell them, right? State university retirement systems, they have, uh, regulations with respect to the riskiness of their assets. They might be forced to sell some of these mortgage-backed securities or commercial mortgage-backed securities. As a result, the market is, is getting inundated with these types of securities, which is driving the price down. So if you're owning this, if you're owning these, you are seeing yourself in a world of hurt. I'm very sorry that's happening. Tom, with um, jobless claims at an unprecedented high and the stock market rising 25% for the last couple of weeks, how do you explain that? Are we on the verge of hyperinflation that could be catastrophic? So the, the stock market is not the market. The stock market is one, um, one barometer of how people feel about a very, very particular sector um, very particular segment of the economy. So I don't have a chart here for the stock, for the stock market. Um, so here's what we have. The stock market fell. So in, in about you know, a week and a half, it fell from highs down to below where the market was um, before uh, Donald Trump was inaugurated president. Okay, so you have this super huge fall. And then since then, it has been climbing pretty steeply. So the percentage gains are pretty astronomical if you consider like how far it fell, how quickly. I mean, it's not, it's not back to where it was. So it fell from maybe 28 or something like this down to less than 20. And now it's going from 20 up to 21. So you're getting seven or 800 point um, increases every every day, which, are, which is insane. And you, you, I mean, you, get some, you get some leveling off, so maybe 700 and then it goes down 300 and then you get 300, five, 500 and goes down 200. But you still have this very, very dramatic increase. The stock market does not reflect um, inflation though. Inflationary uh, trends are driven by money. So inflation is primarily a monetary phenomenon, okay? Well, one of the things that the Fed has done is decreased uh, federal funds rate all the way down to zero. Let me see if I can show you this. Excuse me for a second, please. Here, this is the federal funds rate. So prior to this year, the Fed had been decreasing the federal funds rate. This movement, so in August, September, October of last year, these movements um, would suggest that they had a sense that the economy was teetering on the edge. We might go into a little economic recession. I was su suggesting that the economy was going to go into an economic recession, but I was convinced that it was going to go into an economic recession because of, let's say, farm failures, an increase in, in loan delinquencies from farms. I thought it was going to be a Midwest farming a disaster that would cause us to have an economic recession. But I was thinking the recession might be somewhere between the magnitude of 2001, but certainly less than 2008. So the Fed was probably picking up on a lot of the same signals that I was. 
loan delinquencies from farmers, a decrease in, in exports, um, increase in surpluses of some, some farm uh, outputs, uh, which was causing an imbalance in those markets and causing the economy to shake and shudder a little bit. But what we saw here in, in very early March is the Fed made a very unprecedented move of 50 basis points and then another move of 100 basis points, bringing us down to a federal funds rate of zero uh, percent. Now, now officially the unemployment, so if you look at the BLS, officially the unemployment rate uh, for last month was 4.9 percent, but that's because they, they haven't captured any of those unemployment claims or very few of those unemployment claims yet, maybe, you know, a, a couple million. And so it's been able to, it, wrote, it increased the unemployment rate up dramatically, right? So I'm going to have, let's say, some compensating unemployment rates here um, that I could, that I'll explain this in this paper, but the unemployment rate actually went from about 3.5% all the way up to about 5% for last month. What we're seeing is, um, is that You've got a lot more money, and when you have more money, you sh you could have some inflationary tendencies, but the money isn't being used for consumer goods, which would typically then push up prices. The money is used to protect banks from going into default and from violating some of their regulatory requirements on on how much capital they need to hold. And so, I don't see there being any kind of inflationary tendency. As a matter of fact. I am fearful of deflation, okay? The reason I'm fearful of deflation is because deflationary tendencies tend to cause consumers to forego their future consumption, okay? Uh, let me see if there's a, here, uh, this is industrial production. Um, I have uh, a graph of um, CPI, changes in the CPI. And so I know, I'll have to find that in a second. <clears throat> Other questions. So getting back to that, make sure that you understand. Um, I don't think the stock market's going to cause inflation. I, I actually think we're going to be in a deflationary trend and we are in a deflationary trend. The deflationary trend means that prices are going down. And when that happens, consumers will put off their consumption because they'll say, okay, I'm going to wait for this thing to fall again. I'm going to wait for the price to fall again. I'm going to wait for the price to fall again. When you wait, for the price to fall, and it does, it confirms that you've been correct in holding off your consumption. So then you hold off consumption even more and even more. We already have a lack of consumption. We don't need the deflationary trend to cause even more decrease in consumption behavior. All right, other questions? Yes, Tom, when the pandemic comes under control and the healthcare system is stabilized, do you foresee an economic return after the pandemic, or will there still be lingering effects after recovery? I think there's going to be a lot of lingering reflex, uh, effects. Some people have been talking here, let me show you this. Some people have been talking about this V shaped recovery, if you will, right? And so if we were to look at, let's say, either um, unemployment might be a, a good way to think about this, okay? So uh, I'm not having a good good time. Okay, there we go. So uh, if you have this unemployment, so unemployment like spikes right here, right? So it spikes way up. And people then are some saying, okay, so this might last a quarter or two where it's, uh, let's say, very stable. And then it would spike way back down because everybody would go out and spend, right? So you'd get this unemployment picture that looks like this. So it kind of looks like an upside down V. So this V-shaped recovery, all right? I am thinking that this is going to be much more like a long hockey stick, a long recovery, something that we saw in 2001, the jobless recovery, like we saw in 2008, another mostly jobless recovery that just kind of dredged on and on and on. So we have this spike up, right, with this plateauing, and then instead of spiking back down, we're seeing this, right? And, or it could be even flatter than that. Uh, why, why do we see this secondary rather than this V shape? I think because people are going to be hesitant and they're going to be reserved about how they spend, what they do with their money. So if they, if they make money, they might say, I might save it. What if we have another outbreak in January? What if this comes back again? What if this is seasonal like the flu? Should I be prepared? What if we have to shut down every year for two months before we get uh, some kind of uh, vaccine or something? Well, then 
instead of people just going out and having some kind of huge party, what happens is everybody settles back and says, I'm going to change the way I consume. We saw some of this behavior after 9-11, where consumers, they received some uh, reimbursement checks from uh, the government uh, as part of George W. Bush's uh, uh, policy plans when he was running for president. And so people started getting checks in the, in the summer and late fall of, of for after, before 9-11 happened. And uh, Bush said, go, go, go buy Christmas presents. And so, but there's nothing to buy. Even when there becomes something to buy, I fear that consumers are going to hold on to their money. And they did too. They did in 2001. They just, they held on to their money and said, eh, I'm not going to buy. I'm going to wait for the other shoe to fall. I'm going to wait for something bad to happen again because now I've seen bad things happen. And that's what I'm fearful of. Is as the economy, we say, fine, we're open for business. And people say, I'm just not going to buy anything right now. Uh, I have all the hand wipes that I need. I've got way more you know, N95 masks than I want. I don't need anything else. So I'm just going to shake my hands of it. Uh, I think that that's the kind of recovery we're going to have. It's unfortunate, but I, I think that that's right. With the infusion of so much capital, increasing the Fed deficit and decreasing and the decrease in tax revenue, does the U.S. have to worry about its credit being downgraded? So we would have to worry about our credit being downgraded if we miss some coupon payments to our, uh, so the people that we owe money to. So the U.S. Um, officially has never missed a payment on a bond, um, we, we actually, in fact, missed one payment on one day because of the a rollover issue in the House of Representatives. But, um, but we're, we've got AAA rating, AAA plus rating. We've never missed a bond payment. We're not like other countries, like a Greece, perhaps, who has defaulted many, many, many times. Uh, Venezuela, whose you know, bonds are worthless. So we don't have to worry about that. Our bond rating is then our, our credit worthiness and how people value treasuries. So right now treasuries are valued as a risk-free asset. There's no risk because we've never missed a payment. Um, so taking on more debt doesn't downgrade our riskiness. Missing payments will. So we have to make sure that as we are taking on more debt, that the country is voting to increase our debt limit, which allows us to borrow more to pay off the current debt. And then you might say, that doesn't sound like a plan that you can keep going forever. Can you always borrow more to pay off the previous? It sounds something like a pyramid scheme. Well, the truth is that the U.S. can and countries can because they don't have, let's say, a 30-year work life like you and I. They're, the U.S. has a, you know, 100, 200, 300, you know, hope, you know, they've got a long, long, long work life potential. So they can continue to borrow. I was suggesting last week, and I'm going to continue to suggest that as we come out of this economic recession and if we go into an economic recovery like the one that we were in, we might have to get more fiscally conservative as we start to grow again, that is, as there's consistent growth. So instead of giving tax cuts when the economy is growing, we have to have tax increases. We have to tighten the belt at some point. Uh, I might be in the minority when it, it, with respect to thinking about those policies, but the truth is that we've gotten very, very far away from, let's say, looking at stabilizing policies that once were part of our ordinary policy plan. So when the economy took a downturn, we would engage in a Keynesian fiscal policy and the, all these policies in the CARES Act are, are in that variety. They're all Keynesian fiscal policy, right? And so, so when the economy takes a downturn, you engage in expansionary fiscal policies. Then when the economy starts to swing up, then you contract those policies right? Lower government expenditures, increase tax rates, brackets, what have you, so that you can then pay down your debt. So that the next time that you have an economic depression, you can increase your fiscal policies again. 
it just doesn't make sense that when you go into a recession, you increase your fiscal policies. And then when we're in a recovery, you engage in more fiscal policies, expansion. You can't just have never ending expansionary fiscal policies forever. The math on that doesn't work. At some point, you have to reverse some of those policies and engage in some austerity measures. It's not wise to do it when you're in a recovery, however. Every single time an economy has tried to engage in austerity measures while the economy was in a recovery, it actually caused even a deeper recession. So we shouldn't be raising taxes today or maybe even next year. But down the road, I mean, we, we have to think about making sure that these policies stabilize a little bit of this and a little bit of that. But they're not politically popular for sure. Thank you, Tom. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on the impact of, to the transportation industry like UPS and FedEx? Wow. So that's, I mean, we're, it, there are, um, I'm taking a pause here for a second because my, my uncle works for, my uncle works for um, UPS. He's worked for UPS for uh, maybe 20 years. So they're very, 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 very busy. It's my understanding. Okay, lots of packages being, uh, being deployed, lots of packages being delivered by FedEx, by UPS, because people are ordering stuff. They're not going out. So they're ordering stuff from Amazon. They're ordering things from other online distributors, right? And so they might be doing a, a robust business. Um, but a, a lot of their business has to do with uh, international travel as well, right? And so that's where things might be taking a downturn because we're not having as many international, let's say, cargo flights as we were before. Or certainly some of our domestic airline flights don't have the cargo capabilities. So we have seen the prices of cargo uh, escalate quite substantially. It's actually a case that I gave my MBA students a week ago. And so the, the prices of shipping cargo internationally have skyrocketed. And that could be because of, of clearly there's no, let's say, underbelly opportunities from domestic flights for people to ship cargo. So more of it's going to fall on international cargo flights from your UPSs, uh, FedExs, and what have you. Um, so these companies might be doing brisk business. But they're probably also um, very aware that um, it might be dangerous in some respects. And so, uh, so the UPS packing facility where people are taking boxes and putting them in trucks, I mean, it's, it's, there's a lot of people working there, right? And uh, they're not always working literally right next to each other, but there's a lot of people and they're working in proximity to each other. I mean, clearly these companies are starting to address their concerns about people working in close proximity. And there's gonna be added expenses to make sure that pe those people are shifted in ways that they're not all working together, um, that they uh, have personal protection equipment, which is now really difficult to get. So it's, there's, there are so many moving parts. Um, I think a lot of people would say, well, um, you know, they've, uh, they've got, you know, everybody's shipping everything. So UPS has got to be doing some very, very brisk business. It, that may be the case, but they might be taking on a lot of expenses to make sure that they don't, that they're not having overexposure of their workers. So how it is that they're hiring or keeping workers in place, how it is that they're having them move in their facilities might be very, very, very costly. And so, you know, without doing a complete breakdown of all their costs and revenues, it's hard to say if they're going to make it out of this in much better shape, or it's just people are going to continue to rely on, let's say, shipped goods rather than walking down the store and buying something. Thanks, Tom. And what about the impact, impact on big box retailers, um, shopping malls and such? Well, yeah, so two, I mean, two different things. Shopping malls, so the shopping malls around here are closed. The Macy's is closed, right? A lot of these stores are not um, critical businesses, right? And the, and the businesses that have tried to push themselves off as critical businesses have taken it on the chin. People are um, not very happy with some of these companies. So I want to say it was Hobby Lobby that said, no, we're an essential business. We're going to stay in, in business. And they were getting letters from, you know, the, 
attorney generals and state representatives, and they eventually closed, but they were convinced that they were an essential business, yet they weren't listed as essential businesses. So, you know, you're, some, some companies are essential businesses, clearly, but um, your Steinmarts, non-essential business, like a TJ Maxx, non-essential business. And so um, some of these companies are shutting down. Uh, other of them, like, so the Target, I mean, the Target around the, the corner from my house, that is, because it sells food and, you know, all types of goods and, and, and wares. And so I think the Target is still open. It might be that the um, Walmart down the street is still open. I haven't gone by it, but I'm guessing that they are. They might be doing business, but they might not be doing the same kind of brisk business. So people are afraid to go in the stores. They are only allowing, in some stores I've seen, they're only allowing a certain number of people so that they're monitoring the number of people that are entering and exiting the store. So I, I did go over to Home Depot because I, I needed some stuff for my, my outdoor patio. And uh, and so I got there and the guy was like, okay, you're allowed in. I said, oh, what's, what's the deal? He's like, oh, only a certain number of people are allowed in one person per every thousand square foot or something like that, or hundred square foot. And I was like, wow, okay, that's crazy. Some exits were exit only, others were entry only. So they were trying to keep very strict controls. I have to imagine that these businesses are not doing the same uh, business that they would in the spring. So I am sure that Home Depot's spring flower sales are down by huge amounts. And so some of these businesses are closed, not essential. Others that are open are doing some kind of um, program to keep only a certain number of customers in or out of the store, what have you. As a result, people are weary about going to these places. If they are going to these places, there's, a, there's fewer of them. They're probably buying only a certain type of product. So I can imagine that all of these retailers are, are seeing their revenues uh, fall significantly during this during this crisis. Tom, there was a request to see the initial numbers uh, sure. Here, graph that you had uh, yep. up, up, up earlier, and then there was a question, uh, moving back to unemployment, are freelancers, are freelancers able to successfully file for unemployment, and how but, does that impact the employment numbers? Uh, yes, they are. So here's the deal. The, so, uh, well, there's two things. The one, so this is, this is, these are the new, so this just came out this morning. The April 4th numbers came out at 8.30 this morning. So I was, while I was prepping for this, I was waiting for those numbers to come out. So this is the screenshot from the um, Department of Labor. So 3.3 million people unemployed in March, uh, 6.8 million new unemployment claims March 28th, and then another 6.6 .6 million new unemployment claims for April 4th. So clearly we've got a lot of, um, a lot of unemployment, right? So the way that the, the CARES Act has been, has been put together is that you've got some um, unemployment coverage for people who weren't formally covered. So here, this uh, pandemic Unemployed Assistance, the PUA. So individuals who are not ordinarily covered by unemployment, like self-employed workers, gig economy workers, you know, it, and so if you're not prior to this, you needed to be employed and your employer then would pay into the unemployment insurance program. And then if you became unemployed, you would have to hit some eligibility numbers in terms of the number of hours you've worked or the number of wages that you've accumulated in order to successfully file for unemployment. You could file for unemployment, but you've, in order to successfully receive unemployment compensation or unemployment insurance, you would have had to work for a company for a certain number of hours and or accumulated a certain number of wages because that company has to pay into a bank that covers their workers. And if somebody goes from one job to another job and they didn't work long enough in your company, then they would be withdrawn from the, the reserves of the previous company, okay? But the CARES Act now has this additional provision, this PUA that says, okay, maybe you weren't even eligible for unemployment because you never paid into the unemployment system or your employee 
er did not because you didn't have an employer. Now you can file for unemployment. And so you would do it the same way that everybody else files for unemployment. But when they ask the questions, you would no longer be ineligible because you're a gig economy worker. Now you would be eligible. There's a second element to this. And what happened, this is the Federal Pandemic Unemployment Compensation, F. PUC, which has increased the unemployment insurance compensation amount by about $600 per week for, for recipients. So if you used to get, let's say, $137, now it should be, let's say, $737. There's a sliding scale, and it depends on how long you've worked and what, you, what kind of wages you were lost. Usually you're getting something like two thirds of usually. You we're getting something like two thirds of what you were earning per week as unemployment insurance up to a capped level. Well, this then increase the cap level by an additional $600. Good question. Uh, other, anything else here? Tom, what industries do you think will survive and thrive um, when we're out of the global pandemic and what new skill set should workers be think, seeking or concentrating on in order to uh, recover? Ooh, that's a good question. I mean, it's easy to look at a bunch of industries and say that's not gonna make it, uh, or these industries are gonna have a very, very difficult time coming out of this recession. So I, I think transportation um, is gonna make it, although it's gonna look a little bit different, right? So, I mean, I think, you know, our, our, the airline companies, they're probably going to get bailed out and they're probably going to be there, but they might look very, very, very different than they do right now in terms of the services that they offer, the number of places that they fly to. Um, I think that it's, it's actually a little bit easier to identify the companies that are not going to make it. And I, I think what we're talking about is lots of little retail stores, lots of little retail hubs, lots of restaurants, lots of entertainment just aren't going to come back because there's no capital. I mean, people can't borrow money. I have, I'm afraid that a lot of people who have real, real estate holdings, so have, who invest in real estate, have a robust holdings of, let's say, some commercial property, maybe some residential property, but maybe residential rent properties. I mean, everybody is engaging in what you call rent strikes. So nobody wants to pay their rent. And so if you are operating in these area, in these industries, you, you might be out of business in three months, six months. And that's really challenging because then you could have strip malls that are empty because nobody owns it. The bank owns it and they're not actively looking for, um, let's say, uh, people to fill those offices or fill those stores. So I think people who are at the end of, let's say, this, the dollar uh, chain, if you will, are going to be left holding the bag. Whatever industry they're in, they're going to fail, and it's unfortunate. So let's suppose you're, you've got a bunch of rental properties, let's say um, some, some commercial rental properties or office buildings. Nobody's paying their rent. Cheesecake Factory isn't paying their rent. No one's paying their rent. You might go out of business. Right? And then those business parks might close and just like a bunch of empty office buildings to say, why, why isn't anybody occupying them? Well, one, we don't have any tenants, and two, the bank owns that facility because the person wasn't able to make their loans. And so I think that... People in real estate are really going to take it on the chin. I think lots of small businesses, regardless of what they actually sell, are going to take it on the chin. The type of worker who's going to come out of this and be successful is somebody who can operate at a, a different pitch, um, nonstop, high energy, multitask, um, uh, individually directed self-motivated. So you say, okay, these things need to get done. I'm going to get them done. This is the way I have to do it. I'm going to do it. I have to be flexible so I can get things done. You can show your employer that you have flexibility. Uh, you have ingenuity. You are creative. You are energetic. You're enthusiastic about getting everything done that needs to get done. And those skill sets are going to be highly sought after because people are going to say, okay, when this hits next time, these are the people that we need to help us figure out the problems because it's 
this is not the same kind of, let's say, business problem that we've seen in the past. We say, oh, how do we retain our customers? Or, oh, how do we create more, you know, economic churn? Or how do we get more pop from, you know, our advertising uh, expenditures? N no, like coming up with a, you know, a quirky fun ad isn't going to be useful. It's, okay, when, when everything uh, crumbles, how do we stay on top of things? We need more people like him. We need people like her. They were able to keep things going in the face of all of this. They were, you know, accessible, ready, energetic, enthusiastic, multitasking, and, and highly competent. So people who stuck around, got the job done, they're always valued. They're going to be even more valued now. Maybe those are two high level of sort of characteristics. But I promise you, if you've got people like this working for you, you know who they are, and you say, we, if, if we didn't have this person, we didn't have these people, we'd be in big trouble. That's who you're counting on right now. Got like four minutes. I can maybe I can get two more questions in. Thanks so much, Tom. We're actually gonna start to wrap things up. Okay. Um, on behalf of the Henry Executive Education Team and Tom Smith, we wanna thank you all for joining us. For part two of the Economy and Me series, Tom will be back next Thursday, April 16th at 9 a.m. Eastern time. Um, so we hope to see you all there. Um, a copy of this recording will be available on the Emory Executive Education LinkedIn page. Um, so be sure to check us out there for this recording. And last but not least, uh, we will have a survey pop up on your screen momentarily. We do ask for your feedback um, on the webinar today. We would greatly appreciate if you take about one to two minutes to fill that out. Again, it will pop up on your screen momentarily. Tom, I'm gonna turn it back over to you to close us out. Oh, no, I mean, it's, I mean, next Thursday, we might see another, you know, four or five million people unemployed. Uh, or we could start seeing a little bit of slowdown, depending on what happens this weekend, how many, and new cases and new deaths that, that um, we're seeing. And so hopefully we start seeing a slowdown or a leveling off <clears throat> of the curve. But I think when that happens, that's the time to sort of reassess where we're gonna go economically and when, <clears throat> excuse me, when we're gonna reopen the economy. But even when we reopen it, I think that things are going to be very, very, very slow. But you know, next week, we'll probably talk about new unemployment claims, which might be another 5 million. But also, there might be some better understanding about how these programs have played out. And there is a fourth round of stimulus that's being discussed. And so maybe by next Thursday, we'll have a better idea about what that entails. My understanding is that's going to be much more consumer-focused, where a lot of the CARES Act is focused on businesses, Maybe this is more focused on relief, maybe a mortgage relief, maybe a, a rent freeze, something of that nature, but we should know more by next Thursday. Thank you guys for attending and really good questions. I appreciate it.